Good evening. I'll just call this meeting of the Housing Authority for the City of Salem for Monday, August 22nd, 2022 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Vice Chair Stapleton. I'm here. Commissioner Nishioka. <laughs> Councillor Nishioka is here. Commissioner Phillips. Here. Commissioner Leung. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Nordyke is absent and sitting in for her tonight is guest counselor Bill Dixon. Here. Commissioner Varney. Here. Chair Hoy. Here. And if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Vice Chair Stapleton, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Not tonight. Thank you. We have nobody signed up for public comment for the Housing Authority. Uh, Vice Chair Stapleton, the consent calendar. Yes, I move approval of the consent calendar. I'll second it. Thank you. All right. The consent calendar consists of item 3.1A. The July 25th, 2022 draft Salem Housing Authority minutes. Item 3.3A, the agreement for the Salem Housing Authority to serve as the general manager, Gateway Phase 1 LLC and CDP Oregon LLC. And that concludes our consent calendar tonight. Excellent. Is there any discussion? Will the recorder please call the roll? Vice Chair Stapleton. Commissioner Nishioka. Aye. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Leung. Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Nordyke absent. Commissioner Barney. Aye. Chair Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. And I see that we have no public hearings and no special orders of business, but we do have an information report or two. And I see that we have uh, Ms. Utes here, our housing administrator. Are there any questions or Ms. Utes, did you have any comments that you wanted to start off with before we get to our questions? Good evening, I'm Nicole Utes. I'm the housing administrator for Salem Housing Authority. And tonight on the program uh, management report, you will be able to see a great story of success through our homeless rental assistance program. Even though some hurdles take longer to remove barriers and get few individuals housed, this is a, definitely a success story that we wanted to be able to share with everybody. As well as you'll see that our numbers in our, um, in our voucher program are drastically rising. Um, that is attributed a lot to our outreach navigation and landlord navigation teams that are out there that are connecting individuals with landlords, making those phone calls day in and day out to try to find the next available unit and connect it to the correct individual to get them through the process. I will tell you that we recently, uh, we just put a public notice out regarding um, placing our Section 8 vouchers on hold. We are at capacity for the the normal Section 8 program. Even though it shows in that report that we're at 92%, we are fully utilized in the funding due to the rent increases that have occurred over the last two years. So we are at capacity for the vouchers at this time. We are making notification. Anybody who currently has a voucher and is out on the streets with that, trying to seek out a unit, will continue to be allowed to have that voucher and utilize it. Anybody who has not started the process and is just beginning is now being placed on hold at this time. We will be refocusing our efforts into our mainstream program, which is one that um, we, we were uh, able to su be successful in getting mainstream non-elderly and disabled. However, that came at a, a tough price that we had to go through our entire waiting list to ensure that nobody met those qualifications before we could use those. Uh, through the coordinated entry process or, or get those out in a more emergency housing type situation. We are at the last stand of getting through those applications and we should be able to be able to fully utilize those to, to meet the needs of the community um, since our Section 8 voucher program is full. We are um, looking at all available uh, PIH or public information public and Indian housing notices that are coming out in the effort to make sure that we're applying for any stability vouchers or any other additional vouchers that we can bring into the community to help with this situation. 
Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Uh, Commissioner Leung. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Um, Director Utz, thank you again, also as well as for your for your presentation and for the updates on what the city of Salem is doing, especially for our most vulnerable communities. Um, I know for the uh, for the housing vouchers, those tend to get filled up really quickly. And uh, for years, there used to be like a three, four plus year waiting list. And it sounds like it's full again. Do you have a general idea of when it might become open once more for people to uh, reapply again? Because we are still seeing that need for people in our community, especially um, who are struggling. We're trying to be able to have um, access and affordability to housing. So I don't have an exact timeline when we'll open that. That is a very tough question to answer and one that we try to be as vague as possible in hopes that we're not getting people's hopes up and not being able to accomplish it by saying in 12 months we'll be able to house you or in 15 months we'll be able to house you because we don't want full reliance on that date to come and pass because with many of the situations such as we had one large apartment complex here in town in the previous year that put over eighty thousand dollars in rent increases that was unexpected to the housing authority that changes our our deny dynamics on how many we can actually serve with our voucher program and we are constantly trying to find those offset costs um, that we can apply for through housing and urban development to try to uh, capture some of that funding back and get more vouchers on the street i can tell you with our waiting list closures this is actually a better process for individuals. I know it sounds harsh when they come in and we say our waiting lists are closed, but we also, one of the notices we are, are about to put out is that we are opening a couple of our affordable housing complex sites. Um, this will allow them a, a certain period of time to apply and keeps those waiting lists shorter. So we're not having to go through hundreds of people on a, on a list to try to get to that one that's ready to move in. This actually makes it a fresh list and ready to go when the need comes open. So I don't have an exact answer. I would say probably at least 24 months before we'll open that Section 8 voucher list. Thank you. And one last question, um, since you gave an update on two of the most important programs with the city, if people are struggling, what kind of resources are available to them? So the, the first and foremost is to get onto a coordinated entry, get in to get an assessment through a coordinated entry. And I know that they're expanding the coordinated entry assessment locations to various programs. And I know that through the Homeless Alliance and COC that that is a big uh, conversation is to get more and more locations um, available to be able to make those assessments happen quickly. If they are struggling with rent, um, maybe need just a one-time emergency rental assistance, I would encourage them to contact 211 or Arches Project and see if they have available funding for those immediate needs. The one thing that we do have come through our door on a regular ba basis is that emergency I need assistance today. Unfortunately, the housing authority is not designed for that. We're for long-term stability and we don't have any emergency sheltering right off the bat when they come through the door. So we're in the same situation of trying to guide and navigate people into emergency um, uh, services such as Church at the Park or um, Union Gospel Mission. Samanka's place, there's there's uh, several shelter options. I know that UGM has capacity uh, on a regular or daily basis lately, and we're trying to capture that in-house so that we're giving real-time information to individuals who come in. Thank you, Ms. Utes. I would like to chat a minute about item 6A. The title is a little bit daunting, but I think that the story behind it is not so bleak. And that is the, the phase out plan for the homeless rental assistance program. Can you talk to us about what, what that means and why we're uh, kind of going down this path? Thank you. Again, I'm Nicole Hughes, Housing Administrator for Salem Housing Authority. So, um, the title, I apologize for the title and saying that it's a phase out program. We're not trying to take away the homeless rental assistance program, but really delineate our function here at the Housing Authority for long term stable housing. And what we were the pilot project in 2017 that took on the homeless rental assistance program as an option to um, 
to house the 100 hardest to house in Salem. We were successful with this program for many, many years as one of the leading options for immediate trying to get permanent supportive or housing first, low barrier housing. It has been a great program. It's uh, still in play. We still have 25 uh, individuals that are housed presently through this program. We've assisted over 330 individuals and uh, 380 total household members that through this, through the past five years. Through the collaboration and partnerships that have been built and even became stronger through COVID times, we are seeing that more and more of our partners are out there in the community and are doing a similar program as the Homeless Rental Assistance Program. So we feel that it's time for Salem Housing Authority to phase out to be at least the rental assistance and barrier portion of this. We are finding that the outreach navigation and landlord navigation as being effective tools that we will continue on long term. But there are now Redwood Crossings, soon to be Aquina Hall, Sequoia Crossings. We have Arches Inn in uh, phasing into different layers of that project that are coming into place, Tanner projects, the navigation center that will be hoping, hopefully opening in the uh, fall winter time. There's many more resources at the table today from when the homeless rental assistance program was, was a conceptual pilot project to see if we could make this work. And um, at this time, because the housing authority is also not only the homeless rental assistance program, but the, at 12 months, they graduate into the voucher program. It is making our stabilization from transferring from homeless rental assistance program to the Section 8 program more difficult and understanding that the wraparound services and the case management that came with homeless rental assistance program doesn't necessarily transfer over long term um, from five to 10 years down the road. So we are trying to make a more delineation that we're the Section 8 voucher program, we're a voucher recipient and um, make sure that we have a team that's ready to help with individuals that are transferring into long-term stable housing. Um, it's not that we won't continue the homeless rental assistance program. It is a slow phase out of this. We obviously have clients that are still housed. We have four other years of clients that have been housed and we're still communicating back with. Our case, our outreach navigators are actually going back from the previous years, making contact and making sure that their continued stability is happening and that we're not running into cases where two years later they're falling into eviction status or uh, needing some additional assistance. So that's our number one goal is long-term stable housing. But with efforts with opening all of these facilities, we don't feel that it's absolutely necessary for us to have the general fund assistance from the city of Salem to help pay for rental and barrier at this time, since we're seeking so many options through the housing and urban development and other grant programs to help pay for these into the future. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, and I would add to the list of programs you mentioned earlier, Mosaic, uh, Councilor Nishioka and I toured that uh, last week and. That's a great resource out there for survivors of domestic violence and definitely encourage all of our colleagues to go out and take a tour if you haven't yet. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Utes regarding the HRAP program? Yes, guest counselor Dixon. Ms. Utes, I really appreciate the information um, and the work you're doing. It's incredibly important. Um, I did have a couple of questions you mentioned in the narrative uh, that went along with the agenda, um, the transitional housing programs like micro shelters, Arches in the Future Navigation Center, when those things are all up and running, um, and I'm gathering that some of them are not yet up and running, how many spaces do you believe will be available at that time for people in, in the transitional program? So I can tell you through Church at the Park, there are 70 uh, micro shelter uh, units. I can tell you that's been an effective resource for us to make transition into long-term permanent uh, stable housing. Mm -hmm. Alongside that, I don't have exact numbers. I apologize for Arches in, but I do, I do believe it'll be nearing 80. And I would guess that our, the mosaic is close to 80 as well. In total, I think in addition to transitional spaces that have been, would be estimated at three to 400 additional since the, the start of the homeless rental assistance program. 
Okay, so those are all three hundred, three or four hundred available for um, transitional yes. housing. That's fantastic. Um, and then you also mentioned permanent supportive housing. Do I have that right? Yes. Um, in places like Yaquina Hall, Redwood Crossings, and Sequoia Crossings, um, what what do you see as the capacity availability in those kinds of units? All three of those are Salem Housing Authority developments, and that's a total of 149 permanent supportive housing units that we'll have online by the end, at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, we'll have all of those online. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for Ms. Utes? Did you have any closing comments that you wanted to make? The only thing that I wanted to say is that our staff is fully aware of this phase out program. They do know that we are um, transitioning to a special programs management team that is specializing in our vouchers that need a uh, that they'll be specially trained for not only housing quality standards, but trauma-informed care. Um, we're actually sending them through facilitating for hoarding training so that our agency can lead efforts in, in informing and training others on hoarding situations. But this team will be designed especially for all of our project-based vouchers, all of our special programs that we have coming online and um, we're, they're looking forward to, to being a, a big piece in this puzzle to try to help out the community. Thank you so much. And thank you for ensuring that our, our staff receives the trauma-informed care training. That's so critical. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Everybody at Salem Housing Authority is trauma-informed care trained. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. Seeing no other business before the Housing Authority, we are adjourned. And I will call this meeting of the Urban Renewal Agency for Monday, August 22nd, 2022 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Board Member Stapleton. I'm here. Board Member Nishioka. Uh, here. Board Member Phillips. Here. Board Member Leung. Here. Board Member Gonzalez. Here. Chair Pro Tem Hoy. Here. Board member Nordyke absent. Guest Councillor Dixon. Here. Board member Varney. Here. And Chair Bennett is absent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Not tonight. Thank you. And I see that nobody has signed up for to address the Urban Renewal Agency. Councillor Stapleton, the consent calendar, please. Yes, I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second. Uh, I heard that was Phillips great. First. Second. <laughs> All right. Um, the consent calendar consists of item 3.1A, uh, July 25th, 2022, draft urban renewal agency minutes. Item 3.3A, the Salem Convention Center Amendment Number 1 to the Management Agreement of November 2020 and Marketing Addendum and Budget for Fiscal Year 2023. And that concludes our consent calendar. Thank you. And I would just note that item 3.3A, uh, that the is actually in Ward 2, not Ward 1. That's a, It used to be in Ward 1, but it got moved in our redistricting. Is there any other discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Board Member Stapleton. Aye. Board Member Nishioka. Aye. Board Member Phillips. Aye. Board Member Leung. Aye. Board Member Gonzalez. Aye. Chair Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. <laughs> Board Member Nordyke absent. Board Member Varney. Aye. Chair Bennett absent. Thank you. Motion passes, thank you. I see that we have no public hearings, no special orders of business, and no information reports. So that means the Urban Renewal Agency meeting is adjourned. So I will call this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, August 22nd, 2022, which for the first time in its 165 year history is comp comprised of a majority of female counselors to order. Councillor Stapleton. I'm here, thank you. Councillor Nish Nishioka. I'm here. 
Councillor Phillips? Here. Councillor Leung? Here. Councillor Gonzalez? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hoy? Here. Councillor Nordyke absent. Yes, Councillor Dixon? Here. Councillor Varney? Here. Mayor Bennett absent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are not, thanks. Thank you. And, and now it's time for Councillor and City Manager comments. Are there any? Councillor Stapleton. I guess I'll go first. It always takes one of us to break the ice, doesn't it? Um, first of all, um, Mayor Pro Tem, Tim Hoy, thank you so much for acknowledging um, us females in the room. Um, that just really, like, I didn't realize that was happening tonight, so I'm all kind of, like, choked up. <laughs> um, so thank you for acknowledging that. Um, it really means a lot to those of us. Uh, well, it's to me, I'm sure to my other colleagues as well. Um, I wanted to bring up something really quick here, um, and that is on our agenda, the consent calendar, we have item 3.3E, and I don't have it right in front of me. Let's see if I can grab it really quick so I can read it directly. It is the Domestic Violence Response Team, um, and it's a grant application, and I just wanted to highlight it really quick. I had some questions about this um, over the weekend, and I emailed the chief, and of course, he responded and his staff responded with answers to all of my questions, um, even more than the ones that I had asked. And uh, they gave me a wonderful report that really just goes into the details of what this grant does for the city of Salem and for its residents. And um, I just wanted to thank city staff for that and ask if that could be forwarded to the rest of council because it was really um, helpful for me to just see more about it. Um, you know, what was, what was happening behind the scenes here. So often we see these things come across our desk on, on especially on the consent calendar. Um, and you kind of got to dig a little bit to learn more about the program. Um, and of course, over the last two years of being a city councilor, every time I've done that, I've been consistently blown away with what staff is doing um, for the residents here in Salem. So. Uh, it was a wonderful report, and I just ask that it be forwarded to the rest of council. And I think that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Stapleton, and thank you for the acknowledgement on the uh, the opening. It, it occurred to me with the addition of Councilor Nishioka last week that this would be our first meeting where we had a, a female majority. And it's, you know, Salem has been incorporated for 165 years. And um, the good news is we, you know, we got there. The bad news is it took us 165 years to get there. But uh, we're going to focus on the positive and um, the positive role model that you all play for uh, for the young young girls and young women uh, in our community. And it's, it is so important. The young boys have had positive role models for that whole time, but the, the young girls haven't had nearly as many. And so. Thank you all for doing what you do and stepping up as leaders in our community. And no matter what happens in the November election, because we know that uh, there are both uh, women running in Ward 4, that that majority will will main, be maintained going forward. So it's I think it's really exciting. And um, I'm honored to be uh, presiding over this meeting. So thank you. Are there any other uh, comments this evening? Councilor Leung. Thank you, Mayor Pro Temp. Um, this is uh, Councilor Leung. I just wanted to make um, one brief announcement. So uh, my nonprofit, Micronesian Under Community, had our annual back to school event this past Saturday at Chemeketa uh, Community College. We had a um, we handed out backpacks with school packed already with school supplies. We had a total of 15 different community partners, including state, um, county, and uh, community-based organizations who are providing resources to the community, as well as COVID-19 vaccines for people who were either needing the booster or getting their vaccine for the first time. We also um, had a partnership with Marion Polk Food Chair, who provided um, a shop-and-go kind of style food for people who wanted to come and pick up some um, groceries. We also had hot foods available with 200 plates. And um, Happy to say all the plates disappeared within the first hour. It was a three hour event now. All the plates disappeared within the first hour. Um, we actually still have backpacks that are left over, thankfully. Um, we were getting worried that we were gonna run out. Altogether, according to our registration, it shows about 100 and 
60 something people, but if we also kept track of how many people were in each household. So of the 167 people, it was about 650 people all together within those households. So that's how many people we've made an impact on this past Saturday. It was a very tiring, um, very exciting event. And it's something that we've been doing now for the past three years. And uh, this is a little bit early to announce, but we also have our annual cultural celebration that is happening next month on Saturday, September 10th at the new newer amphitheater. So the Jerry Frank um, Rotary Amphitheater on Saturday, September 10th, starting at 12 o'clock all the way till seven. We're going to have um, food. We're going to have music, singing, dancing, demonstrations, and several um, counselors um, are going to be coming and providing a short speech and um, welcoming our community. So um, thank you to the city for this opportunity and um, for the support for the city of Salem. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you for the important work you do for our community. I do want to just take a quick moment to uh, welcome guest Councillor Bill Dixon, who is uh, filling in tonight for Councillor Nordyke. And I also want to formally welcome Councillor Linda Nishioka to the City Council. She is our new Councillor in Ward 2, so welcome to you both. I also wanted to just mention, um, Councilor Young reminded me that um, last week, Councilor Gonzalez and I had the opportunity to tour the Marion Polk Food Share Youth Farm at the Chemeketa Community College campus. If you haven't had the opportunity to tour that, I highly recommend it. It's a great summer program where, where youth from our area, ages 13 and up, get the opportunity to learn how to garden, how to farm, how to grow food. And uh, that food goes to the to the food share, and it's a really amazing program. We got to hear from young folks who were not only learning those hard skills, but also skills like public speaking and other things that and leadership skills that kind of go along with it. So it's a really great program if you're not aware of it. Um, I, I definitely uh, suggest you look into it. And I know that they take donations in terms of uh, money and that sort of thing in order to sustain the program. So that's through the Marion Polk Food Share. So. Um, uh, guest Councilor Dixon, yes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for the opportunity to participate this evening as a guest counselor. Councilor Nordyke asked me to convey her regrets and let you know that she's on a, a much anticipated and long planned vacation and she looks forward to resuming her duties when she returns. Uh, just a bit about me uh, and my wife. My wife, Pat, and I have lived in Salem for nearly 40 years, uh, 26 of those in Ward 7. Uh, we really treasure this community, uh, the natural beauty, the enthusiastic volunteers, the energetic businesses, the rich, diverse culture. We also admire the dedicated work that the council and the city staff have done to make this a wonderful place to live. And that goes double uh, for your dedicated work over the past three years of what have been some fairly historically bad disruptions. Um, I look forward to experiencing that dedication in action tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Nishioka. Yes, and thank you for the lovely welcome. I want to say, even though it may be a female majority, I feel that we are a team. So <laughs> I don't, I don't want to separate us, but I want us to be joined. <laughs> anyway, I just think it's great to be here, and thank you very much. I really appreciate having gone out to Mosaic uh, to do the tour with um, uh, Councillor Hoy. And um, I am looking forward to this. I'm also so impressed with the city staff. I've been going through my orientation and um, it's going to be a lot uh, to learn. And again, I've just been very impressed with the city staff. So thank you all for what I've already been learning. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? All right, we will go to proclamations then. And tonight we have a September 11th proclamation that I will go ahead and read. Whereas September 11th, 2001, 21 years ago, marks a somber day in United States history. And whereas we remember the nearly 3,000 people who lost their lives on September 11th, 2001 in New York City, 
Pennsylvania, and the Pentagon. And whereas the grief and devastation to this national tragedy was met with heroism, compassion, and union of the American people, and whereas we honor the valor and fearlessness of hundreds of firefighters, police officers, and first responders, as well as ordinary people who instinct was to, whose instinct was to run toward untold danger to help those in need, and whereas the sacrifices made by people on that horrific day remain etched in our minds forever, and whereas we remain a hopeful country inspired by the kindness and compassion of those who live here and our commitment to the freedom and opportunity, and now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, mayor of the city of Salem, do hereby proclaim September 11, 2022, as 9-11 Day of Remembrance and encourage the community to reflect on the terrible events of September 11, 2001, honor those whose lives were lost, as well as the heroism of first responders, and consider making September 11 a day of service in honor of those sacrifices, dated this uh, 22nd day of August, 2022. Thank you. Uh, I see that we have no presentations. We do have some folks signed up for public comment. As a reminder, if you would state your name and your ward or your address, and uh, remember that you have three minutes, and please police yourself, watch the clock on that, because I would rather not have to do that. First up is Annie, Angie Onowuchi, the President and CEO, CEO of Travel Salem. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Hoy and Councilors. I'm Angie Aniwuchi, President and CEO of Travel Salem. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening on Agenda Item 3.3A. As a follow-up to the letter you received, I'm here to report some additional good news. Our number one airline prospect visited the airport on August 12th. We learned three things that day. The representative felt our current terminal facilities met the basic needs for their use, so the airport upgrades only need to meet TSA requirements. We would only be handling about 50 bags of luggage per flight, and the luggage chute we have now is sufficient and doesn't need to be upgraded. His advice was to only spend the minimum amount of money needed to get commercial air service started and show proof of concept. Once the demand has been proven, we can then expand as service grows using federal dollars. This is Fly Salem's message as well. Although we need some funding assistance to get started, spend as little municipal money as we can and expand the federal dollars as service grows. Since that day, we received additional feedback from our number one airline. The representative who visited briefed the airline CEO, who is now even more excited about Salem. The CEO asked to accelerate the plan to launch in March to one destination and add the second and third destinations in May. This would include two flights per week to both the LA Basin and Las Vegas. This airline is interested in having Salem be their Northwest base of operations. This would mean that the air, their aircraft and crew would be based in Salem, a great aviation related job to Salem and boosting economic development throughout the region. When we asked if the airline could wait until 2024, it was expressed that by then they would most likely be flying out of Portland instead. Our consultant feels our number two prospect would follow their lead. As rapidly growing businesses, these airlines do not have the time to wait one to two years when they have planes that are ready to operate now. All that said, I just wanted to share that the situation is quite different from what council discussed just a short few weeks ago. The most important aspects being the terminal doesn't need anything for the airline to start flying now, so we only need the bare minimum alterations required by TSA. We're looking at potentially 10 flights per week to five destinations, with four of those destinations in our top four flight destinations from Salem. We recognize there are challenges to address by March, but Travel Salem, the Salem Area Chamber of Commerce, SEDCOR, and the Fly Salem Committee stand ready to support the city in finding innovative solutions. I'm happy to take questions now, but Tom Hoffert will be sharing some additional information and it might be helpful for us to answer questions at the end of his comments. Thank you so much for your vision and leadership to capture commercial air service for Salem and the Mid Willamette Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? If not, we'll go to Tom Hoffert, the CEO of the Salem Chamber of Commerce. Tom. Good evening, 
Mayor Pro Tem Hoy and City Councilors, thank you for the opportunity to speak in favor of agenda item 3.3A, supporting the purchase of ground equipment for McNary Field. My name is Tom Hoffert, resident of Ward 1, and I serve as CEO of the Salem Area Chamber of Commerce. We represent over 1,000 businesses in Salem and over 50,000 local employees. We applaud the city's consideration in moving forward with ground equipment funding. As we look at the bigger picture for the future of Salem's airport, we see many opportunities for economic development, not benefiting only Salem residents, but countless communities surrounding us in the Willamette Valley. And, we'll view, and we view this as one of the premier opportunities. We're quite excited for a resilient economic development initiative to take home and bring here right to Salem. We recognize that there are hurdles to address as the city's ready for commercial air service to start as soon as March of next year. We're working on these hurdles to, that are facing the city, and we wish to collectively find creative solutions to accomplish the various needs of federal, AB, uh, excuse me, of FFA, FAA, and TSA to make this reality. These hurdles have opportunities with them. Additional parking will bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars of new revenue. We believe a solution to consider would be having public works pave the additional identified parking grounds, doubling the number of parking spots to 300. The department could be paid in full by carving out 30% of parking revenues until the debt is extinguished. Number two, the city consultants identified the necessity to expand the passenger holding area, allocating more TSA screening space, a second gate, and the necessity of additional public restrooms. A local modular building manufacturer is prepared, if contracted, uh, to do this in an effective and cost-effective uh, manner uh, for our city. Given their previous history as the contractor who completed the last two airport expansions, this local company may be uniquely qualified to guide the expansion process. Three, the need for a timely completion of the FAA environmental study and an upgraded TSA security sign-off is absolutely paramount. Fly Salem leadership has met with our two local, uh, pardon me, two U.S. senators to request their executive assistance in getting prompt approvals from the two federal agencies, which leads us to our request. The airport urgently needs more staff to complete the upgraded security plan and the environmental study. We recommend that the airport fund be granted a three-year reprieve from paying general fund transfers, which result in $329,000 per year remaining in the airport budget. This would bridge the gap for hiring additional security staff and support professionals for John Pascal's staff. Each, uh, this morning, each of you received a joint organizational letter identifying a number of unique mechanisms widely deployed by municipalities across the country to generate dollars for key community projects. The Salem Chamber, Travel Salem, uh, the Salem Chamber, Travel Salem, SEDCOR, and Fly Salem are humbled to partner with the city leadership in this economic development initiative. Thank you, Mr. Hopper. Are there any questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have DJ Vincent. DJ Vincent, Ward 3, counselors, it's an honor to be sharing with you tonight. As always, um, I want to start by saying thank you. Um, for believing that together, um, everyone in Salem can have a place to call home. And um, I was encouraged by the report from Nicole Utes on the progress we're making together. Um, if some of you are still um, getting to know Church at the Park, we do exist to partner with everyone in the city um, around nonprofits coming together to navigate our unsheltered guests um, we are working on emergency sheltering and workforce development. So what we've done in the last 18 months around micro sheltering is something we're all proud of, and that is to provide safe, sanitary, and um, housing supported sheltering. So the data, which I can continue to, to share out to the community, is that at the Village of Hope that was open first, um, we've served 211 guests, 25% um, of those to HUD level permanent destinations and over 55% to positive transitionary destinations. Then at our family based site, we've seen 268 people. Um, again, a few um, fewer of those are going to HUD level destinations, but a lot to 
um, those positive transitional spaces, not in parks, not on sidewalks. So I'm speaking tonight in favor of 3.3F, and that would be to allocate funds um, to create um, a shelter for 18 to 24 year olds on Turner Road. Um, this would be 40 additional beds in our community with um, extra supports, with counseling, case management, job and housing mentorship. That's through leveraging youth support dollars. Um, all the other things you've come to expect would be there, 24 seven staffing, um, meals provided, um, a case management ratio, um, medical and behavioral health um, services, uh, a safety team on site. We will um, be suggesting this because then we can leverage um, community donations and dollars um, because we own that property as Church at the Park. We have been working on that site plan for the last year and it's solid. Um, we do have the shelter provider who can do these shelters on wheels that have restrooms and um, it has been assessed over the last 12 months that there are 357 folks, 18 to 24, in Marion Polk County who could utilize this service. Um, and we have actually served 100 of those at Church at the Park. Thank you, DJ. Are there any questions? Councilor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming down, DJ. It's good to see you. Uh, I think that you were just hitting on the point, um, the question that I had, um, and that was the age range that you have on this. Is there a reason why, th does having that age limit restrict you in any way? You know, what happens if somebody who's 17 comes up and needs a place? Are you going to turn them away? Is that how this works? One of the beautiful things is we have Taylor's house. And one of the things we've been talking about with the Homeless Alliance is this continuum of care. And we don't wanna create duplication. And so um, if they're under 18, they could be served by Taylor's house, but we're gonna be right there, even if they need a transition from Taylor's house because they're 18 years old. And uh, again, the surveys are saying that we've been serving this population and the population exists right here in the city of Salem to be served. Thank you. Thanks, DJ. And can you talk to us for a minute about the supportive services? I know that was you had a successful application through the Homeless Alliance. Could you talk for a minute about that and also about your plan for uh, daytime walk up services uh, at, at that site? Yes, at that site, we have offered daytime walk up services for 15 years, but we haven't had micro sheltering for 15 years. Um, we, we've had that now 18 months and we see the incredible impact. I would say over you know, the previous um, you know, 13 years, we helped about 100 folks based on walk-up services get into housing. But we've seen 150 folks in the last 18 months move into housing. So we want to invest in things that are working in incredible ways. And our community is doubling down on outreach so, so to get to the point, we realize it's a trade-off, but we're going to end walk-up service at that site if we develop micro-sheltering on that site for 18 to 24-year-olds. We plan to continue to do intensive outreach to sidewalks and to parks to help those folks find their next best place to be. And um, we are encouraged about adding more youth services we have already brought the psychologist on site on our staff who's going to provide that mental health counseling. Um, we have folks on our staff who are going to do that job mentoring, and we're really proud of our navigation team around the, the housing mentoring that are going to be provided to those 18 to 24 year olds. Thanks, DJ. Are you going to be sticking around until we get to that item on the agenda in case folks have more questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here to, to speak with us tonight. We hope we may be talking with you again here in a few minutes. And next we have Corey Poole, the chair of SEMCA. 
Hello, uh, Pro Tem Mayor Hoy. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd also like just to say it's a it's a really an honor to be on record at such a historic uh, city meeting. I think this is wonderful, a wonderful shift, and it's great to see some new faces on our council. Uh, welcome, and thank you for having me as well. Um, I am also here to speak on uh, agenda item 3.3F regarding the potential funding for uh, micro shelters at uh, 2410 Turner Road. Um, I am here to read basically a resolution from the SEMCA board that on August 9th at our monthly meeting, the SEMCA board passed a resolution of support for the funding of a micro home village at Church of the Parks property located at 2410 Turner Road. It is our understanding that the micro village will support homeless youth and will provide a range of supportive services. It is also under our understanding that this site will not be open for drop in services and that access to the site will be limited to staff, volunteers and persons enrolled in the program. This would be a significant improvement over the current no barrier drop in services currently offered at this site uh, as its impact on the surrounding area has been uh, troubled <laughs> at times. Uh, it is our hope that this change of usage will make a positive shift in the relationship that Church at the Park has had with the surrounding neighbors and that we can have a constructive uh, positive relationship going forward. Um, and I hope that Council will approve funding for this micro shelter program. Thank you, Corey, and thank you for your testimony. Is there, or, does anybody have any questions for Corey? Well, Mr. Poole, I would just like to thank you for sticking with this, uh, being here tonight to talk to us, and uh, being supportive of a plan that I think is a really good alternative. Um, it, it, I mean, it's. I think it's really, uh, really speaks volumes that you're not here just to say no to things or to point out the bad parts of things. You're here to support the good stuff too, and I and I really appreciate that. It's easy to complain; it's not so easy to support stuff that you know that we don't know how it's going to work out. But here you are going on record, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I've actually been a supporter of micro villages for five, six years. Um, I was an advocate before all the start in Salem. It's a great. Uh, it's not great, but it's probably the best we can do in the short run. <laughs> it's, a better, it's a much better alternative than a tent. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming down. Appreciate it. And that concludes our public testimony. So we are on to the consent calendar, Councillor Stapleton. I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 3.3 F pulled by Councillor Phillips. Second. Thank you. All right. The consent calendar is kind of long today. It's all right though. Um, it consists of item 3.1A, the August 8th, 2022 draft city council minutes. Item 3.1B, the August 15th, 2022 draft city council work session minutes. Item 3.3A, adding a project in the uh, fiscal year 2023 to the capital improvements fund budget to um, produce ground support equipment for the airport with state grant funds. Item 3.3B, the intergovernmental agreement with the city of Turner to maintain their traffic control signals and radar reader boards uh, or board equipment, excuse me. Item 3.3C, the intergovernmental agreement with Marion County for the intersection of Gaia Street. Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. And Culver Drive. Item 3.3D, the intergovernmental agreement with, I'm going to say this wrong. How do you say it? Hi, Dana. Okay, I, I thought I was going to say it wrong, but I but I wouldn't. Have. Good job, Virginia. Thank you, Chris. Um, and Detroit Rural Fire Protection District for vehicle maintenance. Item three point three C, or excuse me, E, the Domestic Violence Response Team. Women's. Let's see here. The D V R T Stop Violence Against Women Act grant application. Item three point three G, modification of the explore, explain, explanatory. Oof statement for the Salem Community Capital Improvements Bond. I think that gets everything. And that concludes our consent calendar. Thank you so much. Well done. Is there any discussion? Councilor Leung. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this is Councilor Leung. I just want to make a few comments on 3.3E, the Domestic Violence Can Response Team or DVRT, Stop Violence Against Women. Act grant application, that was a long one. <laughs> and um, 
I'm just really excited that the city of Salem is continuing um, to provide um, services to uh, people who are experiencing domestic violence as a survivor of violence myself. Like this program is something to me that's near and dear to my heart. And I'm just really pleased to see that the city is going to be, again, applying for funding to continue to maintain the full-time uh, DVRT coordinator. Um, I also didn't know if there was somebody who was on who could answer a really quick question. I do think we have somebody here. We Oh, we have Chief Womack. And, and I'll oh. do my best. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. And just a really simple question. Um, so for the $400,000, uh, besides funding like a full-time coordinator, um, I was reading through the summary description. It also talks about um, activities that would be provided. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail on what some of those activities might consist of? I know that that supports uh, the activities around providing some temporary housing as well. So funding for the hotel rooms, um, just to kind of fill that bridge, that gap between the night of an occurrence to when they can connect it to some more permanent supportive housing options. Um, we also have a program to provide cell phones um, to victims so that they can have access to a new cell phone line uh, that they may need after an incident occurs. So it's those type of supportive services and activities that are included. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Counselor. Is there any other discussion on the consent calendar? If the recorder will please call the roll. Counselor Stapleton. Aye. Counselor Nishioka. Aye. Counselor Phillips. Aye. Counselor Leung. Aye, and if there was a way to do double eyes for three, three, three E, do that too. <laughs> Counselor Gonzalez. Aye. Yeah. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke absent. Councilor Barney? Aye. Mayor Bennett absent. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. We are on to public hearings. Uh, item 4A. If the recorder will please announce the hearing. The Salem City Council will now conduct a public hearing to receive testimony concerning proposed solid waste management service rates Individuals testifying are limited to three minutes, and please provide your name and address or ward number. We have one person signed up, and uh, Ryan Zink will start with the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Zink. Good evening. Thank you, Pro Tem, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Uh, pleasure being here tonight. Just get this set up here real quick. And my name is, uh, so yeah, good evening, uh, City Council. My name is Ryan Zink. I'm the Franchise Administrator for the City of Salem. Uh, during this public hearing, I'll be presenting the Solid Waste Rates Proposal, effective January 1st, 2023. State statute gives local jurisdictions the primary responsibility for solid waste management. Additionally, we find that legislative intent is that a city or county may displace competition with a system of regulated collection service by issuing franchises, which may be exclusive if service areas are allocated. This is why uh, we, why each of the haulers have exclusive franchises to provide service within a designated area. The city's code, oh, excuse me, the city's code uh, charges city council with the responsibility of setting rates by service or by zone. And the council shall consider certain factors when setting those rates, including a reasonable operating margin. The recommendation for this public hearing is to approve the proposed solid waste rates found in resolution 2022-47, which would be effective January 1st of 2023. The high level summary of this proposal includes the addition of 20 gallon every other week residential service, increasing the senior disabled low income discount from 10% to 20%, and then a combined increase of 6.45% in Salem Marion and a combined increase of 9.18% in Salem Polk. At the beginning of the rate review process, Salem's haulers submit to the city their most recently completed financials and year end projections for the current year. Based on the financials submitted, the haulers requested an increase in 2023. 
Following this request, the city engaged Marina and Company, the city's solid waste consultant, to review the, the hauler's financial statements and to perform what is called a cost of service analysis, which is an analysis of how much it costs to provide this service to customers. As part of the city's review, the hauler's revenue and expenses are tested to make sure that they're reasonable and accurate. Next, we estimate what the future revenue and expenses will be and estimate the hauler's pre-tax return on revenue or income. Then the proposed rates are calculated to allow for a 10% pre-tax revenue. Out of that 10%, approximately 3% is paid in taxes by the haulers, with the balance going to owner profit and reserves that are necessary for a capital heavy industry. The cost factors considered during the analysis are included on this side, uh, starting with fuel. We've all experienced the increase in fuel prices over the last 12 to 18 months. And for an industry that relies heavily on very large diesel trucks, this has been a significant impact on operational costs. Thankfully, we have seen a slight decline in the last few weeks. This all translates into a nearly 50% increase, <clears throat> excuse me, 50% increase in fuel costs during 2022 with an expectation that it will decline during 2023. Labor and medical insurance are based on recent activity. However, uh, pressure to increase wages and difficulties in hiring CDL drivers could push costs higher. Disposal costs have an overall increase of 1.7% in 2022 and 3.6% in 2023. And I'll show a breakdown of this on the next slide. <clears throat> In general inflation, which uh, also encompasses vehicle depreciation, is seeing a nearly 9% increase during 2022, but is expected to be lower in uh, the next year. And uh, something to keep in mind is both delays in supply chain and high steel prices continue to impact the ability of, uh, to order new carts, containers, and vehicles crucial to the haulers' operations. As I mentioned on the earlier slide, the combined increase for, for disposal costs is 1.7% and 3.6% for 2022 and 2023, respectively. This, uh, the breakdown of each disposal type is displayed here on this table. The disposal fee at Covanta Marion, where much of the garbage in, in Marion County uh, is taken, is not changing and remains at $87.45 per ton. The disposal fee at Coffin Butte, the landfill in Corvallis, where garbage from Polk County is taken, uh, increased $3 per ton in 2022 and is expected to increase $1.50 or 3.9% in 2023, increasing it to $39.50 per ton. Mixed organics, which include yard debris and food waste, increased, increased $5 per ton in 2022 and is expecting an increase of $16 per ton in 2023 just over 23%. Last year, year's forecast projected a $5 per ton increase each year for four years, bringing the new rate for mixed organics closer to other comparable disposal fees. However, the recent inflation was, has triggered an acceleration of that timeline, increasing the disposal fee from $69 to $85 per ton. Finally, commingled recycling, uh, that is the recycled material collected in the blue bin, um, the, cur the curbside cart, uh, is not expected to change much in 2023. Uh, however, from month to month, the market for recycled material can vary quite a bit. Um, over the last 12 months, it's pretty much broken even. The cost of processing the material minus the market commodity rate hovers around zero. Here we have the results of the cost of service analysis, showing the actual pre-tax return on revenue for the last two years in 2020 and 2021 the projected run, run, excuse me, the projected return for the end of this current year, 2022, and the forecast for 2023, if no rate increase is approved. Return on revenue for Salem's haulers within the two zones are break, broken out separately because of notable differences in rates and variations in cost drivers uh, used to calculate operational costs, such as disposal fees and transportation costs. Even with the significant inflation during 2022, the haulers are projected to have a combined pre-tax return of 8.1% by the end of 2022. However, if no rate increase is approved, their combined return is forecasted to drop to 4.5% uh, next year. In order to maintain a sufficient operating margin, staff is proposing a combined increase in Salem Marion of 6.5% and a combined increase in Salem Polk of 9.18%. 
effective January 1st of 2021. The components of these increases are listed here. In Salem, Marion, cart increases, uh, excuse me, cart services would increase 8.48%, container services 1.83%, and Dropbox rentals 7.85%. In Salem, Polk, cart services would increase 10.54%, container services 1.68%, and Dropbox rentals 15.61. Uh, the proposal tonight also includes two service changes. In response to requests from community members, starting in January 2023, we are proposing the addition of 20 gallon every other week's residential service as a regular full service option. It would consist of bi-weekly collection of garbage and, um, and recycling and weekly collection of mixed organics. This service would be offered at approximately 30% less than the regular 20 gallon weekly service and provides a less expensive option for those who may not produce enough trash to fill a 20 gallon cart every week. The weekly 20 gallon service will still be offered as, a, as an available option. This table shows the weekly and biweekly equivalency of the gallons collected by each service level. As you can see, the 20 gallon every other week option adds another level of service and customers will now effectively be able to have a 10, 20, 35 or 65 gallon um, collected op, uh, weekly. Also, staff is proposing a change to the existing Senior Disabled Low Income Discount Program, which currently offers a 10% discount to qualifying residential customers. To help offset increased costs experienced by our low income residents, staff is proposing to increase the discount to 20%. With a standard 35 gallon cart service, this is a savings of $6.19 each month for qualifying customers. We'll be leveraging the existing partnership that, that the city has with Midwamet Valley Community Action Agency to qualify residents during the annual uh, renewal period for the city's utility rate relief program. Both programs have the, have the same qualifications. This slide shows the impact of the proposed increases to the subscribers of CART services in Salem Marion. As these uh, figures represent a two month bill, again, uh, Solid waste uh, is billed uh, every every two months instead of monthly. Um, in 2023, a subscriber of the 35 gallon service would see an increase of five dollars and forty cents every two months. So that's every bill, or thirty two dollars and forty cents annually. Additionally, we see the proposed uh, rate for the 20 gallon every other week service, which uh, is twenty two dollars and ten cents a month, or the uh, forty four dollars twenty cents for every every bill every two month bill. And this slide shows the impact of the proposed increases to subscribers in uh, Salem Polk. Again, these figures represent a two month bill. In 2023, a subscriber of the 35 gallon service in Polk uh, would see an increase of $5.50 every two months or $33 annually. And again, the 20 gallon every, work, uh, every other week service is in Salem Polk would cost $34.70 every two months or $17.35 a month. This chart shows the current rates for 35 gallon residential uh, service uh, in uh, in comparable cities, along with the current and, pro and proposed rates for 35 gallon service in Salem. When comparing the residential monthly garbage service to the current rates in other Oregon cities and those with similar service levels, the rate in Salem remains consistent. It's important to note that haulers in Salem uh, provide several services not available in many other communities, such as curbside uh, food waste collection uh, and curbside recycling of motor oil, uh, antifreeze, latex paint, cooking oil, and household batteries. For customers looking for another cost saving option, the haulers do provide on call service. Customers would receive a um, 35 gallon cart for trash. Um, however, this service does not uh, add a space, include uh, recycling or yard debris. But when the cart is full, customers call their hauler and it's collected on the same day as the regular weekly service in that area. Customer uh, is, is The customer is charged for each uh, pickup rather than a monthly rate. In this case, that's uh, $12.10. Uh, in Marion or $10.65 in, in Polk, and that would be the 2023 rate. 
Um, and then if uh, they want to add mixed organics or recycling, that can be added for an additional fee. Salem haulers also provide uh, medical waste collection through a joint company called Marion Environmental Services. They collect medical waste from medical facilities throughout Salem, providing three levels of service, low volume, high volume, and hospital collection. Adjustments to these rates are also done to target an 8 to 12% uh, uh, pre-tax return on revenue. The projected pre-tax return for medical waste in 2022 is 5.4%, and 2023 is 1.9%. As you can see by this table, the high volume service is projected to be negative for both years. This necessitates a larger increase in that line of service. The proposed increase for 2023 is 5.6% for the low volume service level and 17.3% for the high volume with no increase for hospital collection. The current rates for medical waste collection include a rate for the first box and another lower rate for each additional box collected during the month. This model can be confusing for customers and does not account for the high fixed cost of collection. Uh, the proposal uh, tonight eliminates the tiered structure and proposes a single rate for each line of service and box size. Before I wrap up my presentation, I wanted to remind everyone of the current low income discount program. Again, this has the same qualifications as the city's utility rate relief program. And if customers think they might qualify, they can contact uh, the community action agency at the number listed here or stop in their office. <clears throat> and if today's proposal is approved, qualifying customers will get a 20% discount off their monthly residential bill starting next year. In conclusion, staff recommend that City Council adopt resolution 20, uh, excuse me, resolution number 2022-47, establishing new solid waste management service rates. If adopted by City Council, rates listed in attachment 2, which includes the proposed service rates, uh, service changes, would go into effect January 1st of 2023. And customers re will receive a 30-day notice of rate changes from their local hauler. Before I conclude, I just wanted to open uh, and open the um, floor to questions. I wanted to introduce uh, Kevin Hines, Dan Strandy, and Jamie Peterson that are here tonight from Mid Valley Garbage and Recycling Association. Also, Tanya Moffitt, uh, the city's solid waste consultant from Marina & Co is here tonight uh, and is also available to ask, uh, answer questions. And with that, I am uh, concluding presentation and happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zink. Before we go to questions, we will go to public testimony. We do have one person signed up. So if I could get you to stop screen share for a few moments, that'd be great. Absolutely. Thank you. We will go to our person signed up. That's Suzanne Kaltwasser. Suzanne, you're up. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my my text is hidden. So just give me a second here. Um, I want to thank you for um, this opportunity to speak to the council on this matter. Um, the last time I spoke to council, first of all, my name is Suzanne Kaltwasser and I live in Ward 8. And I'm here tonight representing um, Clean Air Now Coalition. Um, at our The last time I spoke, um, staff recommended, I mean, Council recommended that I speak to staff, uh, and we had a very productive meeting in June that we are glad to see some of our conversation and recommendations are in the current uh, proposal. However, um, we have concerns about the fact that it's only for the 20 gallon uh, size uh, carts and would really like to see that extended to all of the carts because currently the only people that are likely to qualify are going to be uh, small households and there are other um, households that deserve to have those options available to them so that they can um, address their family budgets. Um, the ultimate goal is to reduce waste. Salem is uh, per capita one of the highest producers of garbage 
And um, we all know that we need to reduce our uh, carbon footprint, but we also uh, need to uh, maximize the incentives that are available to people. And one of the ways is through the costs and, and the rates that you are setting tonight. Um, we want to, uh, during our conversation with staff, we wanted to explore more options that might be made available to customers, but we were told that they couldn't proceed with any of our um, suggestions until the city council established policies through the, your annual policy setting process. And that would take uh, a minimum of a year and that was um, pretty disappointing that we would have to wait so long. We'd like to see if there's ways which that could be sped up so that you could give direction to staff um, to look at some of the things that might be possible. One of the things that we noticed is that other cities are providing equal services for a lower cost, or in some cases, even more services for a lower cost. And we started to ask questions why that might be but staff said they are limited uh, by the existing policies to even explore those uh, questions. Um, and um, I'm sorry, uh, your time's up. Okay. Apologize. We did get your written testimony, however, so I, I'm hopeful that all of my colleagues, uh, you read your written testimony. But perhaps folks have questions for Ms. Kotwasser? No questions? Thank you for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and now it's time for questions of staff. Are there any questions for Mr. Zink or for any of the other professionals here? Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few, but I'll start with one. And I think it would be helpful, um, Mr. Zink, if you could, for the public's benefit, explain why we have areas that haulers are kind of, um, um, I'm missing the word here, but we have what, six different haulers and they each have their area. And could you please, for the benefit of the public, explain why that is? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Councilor Stipson for that question. Um, so there's uh, probably a, a couple different uh, elements to that. Um, one of it is simply the, 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 the longstanding history of where haulers have uh, provided service uh, in certain areas within the city. Um, <clears throat> some of that is that they're not just providing service to that one exclusive area within the city, but they also, uh, that service extends out into either Polk or Marion County. And so the, the part that they're serving within the city is a, a portion of their overall service, ter service territory within that county. Um, how those original lines were drawn, um, I can't speak to that. That was um, decades ago, um, many generations ago. Um, they don't change uh, necessarily. Um, however, what I can say is that through our uh, regulatory authority of that service within the city of Salem, all of those haulers um, per should be providing and do provide the same service for the same rates or by zone. So Polk County and, and Marion County have slightly different rates um, due to some factors there. But the service that's provided um, and whether it be customer service or the service at the, at the street level is the same um, throughout the entire city. And if there is a difference in that service, uh, customers are welcome to call me and we will uh, figure out why they're not getting the service that they, that they need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Nishioka. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ahoy. Uh, um, Mr. Zink, can you explain a little bit about, well, well first off, I wanted to say uh, that's great that um, you're offering uh, increasing a discount from 10% to 20% um, for seniors and disabled. That's marvelous. Can you explain to me um, how frequently they have to reapply? Is there um, any um limitations is it how long is it um good for that that application sure yes thank you counselor so the um the application process process would be on the exact same cycle as the uh, city's utility rate relief program 
So since they have the exact same qualifications, a customer only needs to qualify once. And once they go through that qualification, um, uh, the community action agency now knows that they do qualify for both. So that information will be shared with both the say, uh, the city's utility program and then also the haulers that provide service in the city and will be able to get that discount starting at the same time. But there is an annual renewal process that customers will need to go through for, for both programs. So annual renewal, but it expands so that one application serves more. Wonderful. Yes, Thank absolutely. Thank you. Councilor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Mayor uh, Pro Tem uh, Chris Hoy. And thank you, Ryan, for your present uh, presentation and answering our questions so far. Um, uh, my, my first would be more of a comment, Ryan, in reviewing the documents yesterday afternoon. I have to say I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I feel like this is a, a serious step towards um, what I've heard the community advocate for in the past couple of years uh, in terms of providing two more options that kind of follow that pay as you throw model. So uh, I appreciate as a counselor seeing that represented in our policy options this year, uh, the every other week option and the you know collect when you've got garbage option. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, and I guess my follow up question would be, uh, you know, I've heard that we didn't maybe go far enough offering enough options. Um, I don't know if I agree with that statement, but, you know, is there a, a cost or a, an issue with offering, you know, at a 35 gallon, um, you know, garbage can every other week? I mean, to me, it seems like someone should just go to the lower amount, the, the 20 gallon. Um, what does it look like to actually do what, what others have asked for, the, the other options, the 35 and the 60 uh, every other week? Sure. So um, thank you, Councillor, for that question. So, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the natural progression of a, uh, a lesser or lower cost option to the 35-gallon uh, weekly service would be going to the 20-gallon the weekly service. It's approximately half, so 35 down to 20 gallons. Um, the 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 um, issue that we run into it as we expand, um, uh, if we were to look at expanding uh, an every other week service for the 35 gallon, the 65 gallon, is that the um, because of the fixed costs uh, within the system, there's really very very little savings um, with a uh, the, the in the system to pick up. You know, weekly on one, and then not, uh, and then every other week for the for the ne next door, the the next house down the street. So, as long as there's one person on that street that is getting weekly service, the cost of providing that service is essentially the same. There's very little cost savings, um, and so really, uh, if we want to look at expanding that option, um, we need to uh, look at the whole system and see what makes sense in terms of providing a cost-effective service to the customers with all the options that, that are being asked for. So that's where providing the 20 gallon every other week service does add kind of one more tier, adds a fourth smaller tier, allows customers to save some money, and then there's an incentive there. Um, quite frankly, that service is being subsidized by the other services, the other larger cart or more more frequent services. So, as we if we extend that to 35 or 65 gallon, there would be uh, an additional subsidy that um, kind of throws the, the the system out of balance. Thank you, Ryan, for that um, that answer. It, it helps me understand this. Um, and I think that having listened to both, you know, staff's presentation on this, as well as, uh, you know, the community requests, I think you've done an excellent job of balancing and, and moving us forward in a really constructive way. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor Tim Hoy, Mr. Zink for your work and uh, the haulers. I mean, they're literally doing our dirty work. You know, I um, wanted to ask you a question, Mr. Zink to help answer a question I get a lot. And is it, why are we limited to this many haulers and no new entrants are allowed? So uh, it goes back to our, um, uh, the state statute that allows cities to uh, provide those exclusive territories to the haulers. Um, part of the reason for that is that if we do have, uh, if we open the market to a competitive, uh, kind of a competitive system, 
you would end up having uh, multiple companies driving down the same road. Um, that increases emissions, that increases uh, road uh, miles traveled, and it's not really, uh, I think, a, an effective and efficient uh, use of the city's public roads for providing the service. I like to think of this uh, similar to any other utility, uh, whether it be gas or electric um, uh, or, or, or water utility. I mean, we only have one electric utility provider for any given home. We only have one natural gas provider for any given home. Same thing with our water. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to have multiple utilities serving the same house. Thank you, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to circle back to what Councillor Nishioka had just brought up, and that is about our um, our kind of our um, low income for seniors, uh, low income and differently abled folks um, here to qualify. For me, when I think about a program that has an annual renewal, I, I question how we could maybe lessen the cost of that program and maybe expand it to say a, a five-year renewal. Um, some of the things that we have on the list, um, I hate to, to bring this up, but our senior citizens, um, right? They're, they're not getting younger. So they kind of are, they're in the program and they're kind of there to stay. Um, and, uh, you know, the different things that we have that qualify you being differently abled or lower income, those aren't necessarily hurdles in general that you get over in a year. Um, I, I understand there's some, some, some nuance here, but I'm just wondering if, there is an added cost to the program by having it every year renewal versus every five years um, to kind of help alleviate some of that that cost and also alleviate the the headache of folks who are struggling um, to then have to sign back up for a program um, that that they know they they qualify for and, and it's just kind of a, a hoop that's just a hoop to be a hoop if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and really, you know, how often should uh, renewal, um, th th that renewal occur? Um, and I, I would want to uh, um, have that conversation in combination with our, our Salem utility. Um, since we are essentially piggybacking on their existing program, um, I think that's a conversation we, we could certainly have with public works, um, s considering that it's the same, uh, the same qualifications. Uh, thank you. And and Mayor Pro Tem, could I ha ask one more? Thank sure. you. Um, in regards to, actually up to, I'm sorry. Um, in regards to uh, Councillor Gonzalez's comments, I hear a lot in my area, just a general frustration with the hauler that services our area. And I know that they are unique in our area because they are not locally owned. Um, mm -hmm. The folks... Um, that I, you know, I used to work in the industry at Valley Recycling. Um, and so I know a lot of the, the folks in the industry and these are salt of the earth people, uh, wonderful members of our community. Um, and the folks who do come by my house and pick up my garbage are wonderful. Um, I make sure to tip them every Christmas. And, um, but there does seem to be a breakdown when it comes to customer service with the folks who are out of state. And I'm wondering, uh, speaking on behalf of those I've heard from in my ward, um, is there any kind of, you know, a avenue that folks have any kind of help that, you know, they're really frustrated um, with this out of state service. Um, and so is there anything we can do about that to help these folks? Uh, absolutely. Actually, there, there is something that I uh, was work uh, talked with the haulers earlier today as we were kind of prepping for this meeting. Um, I was reminded by uh, some of the, the testimony that we, we received um, and had a feeling this might come up this evening. So one thing that, um, uh, so I, to, to speak to, uh, not naming any names, but speaking of the hauler that, that, that you're referring to, <clears throat> part of the issue is that a number of years that that national company made a decision to move their call center to um, out-of-state call centers. They are consolidated that service. Uh, that call center. Um, the local team, the local folks for, for that company um, advocated not to do that. They advocated to keep that, that call center locally so they can continue to effectively and efficiently serve 
uh, their customers here locally. Now, the good news is that most of the calls have been returned and still are picked up locally in the in the call center, whether it be here in, in, uh, in Salem or at the, the Corvallis call center. Unfortunately, there are still some calls that get routed, whether it be um, when the local call center is busy or nighttime or that sort of thing, off hours that's picked up uh, at the national call center. Uh, one thing that we have um, at our discretion is with our franchise agreement, we can dictate um, where that call center needs to be located. And I'm going to be looking at um, what we need to do to amend our contract to require local, uh, all, all calls be picked up at a local call center. So that is, that, that's something that I'd like to, to explore and look at as we're looking at this uh, new uh, council policy on solid waste. That's fantastic news. Um, and I, I really appreciate you taking an extra look at this because it, it has been something that people have struggled with over the years. And so I appreciate that extra work. Um, my last question for the evening, I promise, um, is when we talk about reducing our size of garbage can, um, you know, I was trying to think of, of what I would be able to do with a family of four. I have a 35 gallon can. It's not full every week, but how can I get down to a 20 gallon can or better yet? How can I get all the way down to a 20 gallon can every other week? And it comes down to that darn recycling and how we can't recycle as much as we used to. And I would love to hear any kind of hopeful story or vision casting or anything to give us all hope for getting back to where we were and maybe even better with our recycling program. Can you speak to that at all? I, I'd be happy to. In fact, um, recently uh, legislation, uh, state legislation passed the Senate Bill 582, which is, I think it's called the, the Oregon Recycling Modernization Act. And there's a couple of elements to that. Um, I'm not an expert on it. Um, I'm happy to send you some additional information or get you in touch with uh, an expert on it. Uh, there's a, a very nice lady by the name of Kat Rhodes who works for the DEQ. She uh, represents our area here and she would love to talk to your ear off uh, all about it. Um, but the gist of it is a couple of things. One um, is a, a, a statewide um, recyclable item list. So whether you live in the city of Portland, the city of Corvallis, Salem, or Newport, there'll be one list of what is recyclable, what goes in that recycling cart. Um, it's also expanding um, recycling to all communities. It's not just um, uh, cities of 4,000 uh, population or larger. The other uh, element of that is what's called um, uh, producer responsibility um, and creating uh, producer responsibility organizations or a PRO. Um, producers of uh, certain types of material uh, would be required to uh, um, become members of that PRO um, and pay fees and dues into, into that uh, um, producer re recycling uh, organization. The idea with that is that um, those fees help to improve our recycling infrastructure uh, to um, find end markets for recycled material, improving our uh, our infrastructure, whether it be collection um, uh, collection depots or processing, to uh, maximize uh, use of those recyclable materials. The the key there is that the as as those producers um, improve their material and make it more recyclable or offer more recyclable options, their fee is reduced into the PRO. So they have an incentive to improve their products to make them more recyclable. Um, so the, uh, the city will be going through a uh, assessment process uh, coming this spring. Uh, we'll, be get, we'll be getting some information this fall kind of leading up to it to help us prepare for that assessment process. So we'll be looking and seeing that uh, coming this spring. Um, and then uh, different elements of the, uh, uh, the Oregon Mo Recycling Modernization Act will be implemented uh, over a number of years. Um, if I apologize, I don't remember if it's July 1st of 2025 or 26, but we've got a couple of years to um, kind of get our ducks in a row uh, before that's implemented um, uh, out a couple of years. One other major piece of that is the addition of um, recycling for multifamily. That's a, a there'll be an added requirement of uh, the, the uh, Modernization Act. 
Thank you so much. That is really helpful and, and hopeful as well. Thanks. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zane. Councilor Leon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, Pro Temp. Um, this is Councillor Leung. Uh, Mr. Zink, I have a few uh, additional questions about the uh, rate increase. Um, first and foremost, can you tell me how much of that percentage increase is going to be going towards salary for the workers, if any? So I don't know if I can quantify how much of that increase is going towards salary, but I can tell you that um, for 2020. Uh, let me pull it up here again. I apologize. Um, the s salary in, uh, increase um, for 2023 uh, is, I believe, 5% uh, uh, expected increase. Um, and then that also includes uh, uh, health insurance. We did find out recently that the cost to the haulers for increased insurance, um, their, their cost increase to provide the insurance is somewhere around 15%. So that was previous to um, our, our analysis. They are going to be absorbing that additional cost. So that's going to come out of out of their 10% margin um, with no change in the uh, level of insurance that they're providing to their employees. So, but they're expecting uh, on average a 5% increase in wages. Okay, thank you. And I have a additional question um, relating to um, looking at the, the proposal, specifically uh, two different parts. One, the 20 gallon every other week EOW service. And um, there was also mentioning of a discount for people who are seniors and also people who are disabled low income customers. So if people who are seniors or disabled low income customers chose to go through the EOW route, would they also be eligible for the discount at the on top of the new monthly rate? Uh, yes, so the, the discount is off any residential uh, service that's provided. Now, they need to be um, the account holder. Um, uh, and also, uh, it does, so in other words, it doesn't apply to the landlord uh, of a multifamily or even a, a single family homeowner, uh, excuse me, single family residence um, if the account is in the landlord's uh, name, but the uh, uh, resident is uh, is the uh, is low income. It, the the account needs to be in the the name of the of the person who is qualifying. Thank you. And I have another follow up question. Um, this is relating to the offset increases in rates. And so, just to be clear, that the person has to have their name on the account to be able to get the twenty percent discount. Correct. Correct. Okay. Or, or there needs to be so someone within that household who's living within the house needs to be um, the uh, needs to be qualifying. So I mean, if this uh, spouse has their name on the account, but the other spouse is the one uh, qualifying, so it's the it's a household income is what they're looking at. So we are looking at at the entire household. Again, okay. it's the, it's the exact same qualifications as the the, the uh, utility rate relief program for the, for the city water and sewer program. Okay, so the three the three bullet points um, are 60 years old, a named customer, have household income. As long as they meet one of those criteria, they would be eligible or they have to meet all three. They need to be uh, senior or disabled. So one or the other of those and then meet the low income qualifications. So if, it, if let's say it was uh, an adult taking care of a child, that child they wouldn't be able to be eligible because a child is too young to be put on the on the billing statement or account. Uh, correct. So again, from a from a low income perspective, um, you're looking at yes the account or well from a from a disabled perspective, you're looking at the uh, the account holder, and then from a low income perspective, you're looking at the entire household. Okay. And uh, my other uh, question that I have is I'm continuing to try and understand where this uh, increase is coming from. Um, let's see. How do they apply for it? Is that something that's readily written within their bills, uh, first and foremost? And how do you do outreach to ensure that 
people know that's like you had mentioned you know sometimes it's it might be a a, um, a a couple or it could be several people who live together who pay a bill together and one of them has a disability or who is elderly but income wise they still need it but then that person's name is not listed on there how would you how what's the outreach method to ensure people know about this so uh, currently, the, the so in order to qual- qualify, they would need to contact the Mid Valley Community Action Agency. Um, if they currently qualify for the the city's program, they will automatically be rolled into. Um, which I believe the city currently has about six hundred and fifty. I think it's six hundred fifty one qualifying uh, customers, and so those will um, roll into that same qualification in twenty twenty three if they uh, as part of that renewal process. That's, in terms of the outreach, um, I will I will full admit that um, that there's not been I don't think sufficient outreach um, and and um, uh, we have we haven't done enough to make sure that people know about this program and so that's something that uh, I, I want to work with the haulers either putting something on uh, bills um, or p- providing more information something uh, more on uh, the city's own website and 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 social media. Uh, it's outreach areas to make sure people are aware uh, of this program. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Like, oh, sorry. It's okay. Last question. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, again, this is Councillor Leung. And um, this is again relating to the, um, uh, to the, to the, to the, the discount opportunity. Do they have to have a certain citizenship status? Um, that I don't know. And I would, um, I, I would, that, you know, that's something that we can we can go back and let you know about. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how that plays into the qualification of what the community action agency looks at. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zink. I just have a couple of comments. One um, regarding the outreach, I do think it's important that we make sure that people are aware of this program. Uh, I think that we have that problem with the utility uh, billing and, and they really stepped up the efforts with that. They included in the electronic billing, they included in the regular building, billing. I think we need to be doing that with our, uh, I think that needs to go out at least annually in, every, in with the garbage bills. Um, I think that's really important because if people don't know that a program, program exists, they're never gonna apply for it. So I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to get that information out and it's incumbent upon us to make sure the, gar- the haulers are doing that. So I would encourage you to make sure that that happens. I also want to correct something or at least give us some additional information from the written report and also a comment you made tonight. I know my garbage hauler bills monthly. You, you've said about uh, every other month billing, but I've been getting a monthly bill for years from my garbage hauler. Uh, so I think it probably varies throughout the city. So I just wanted to make you aware that there are at least, there's at least one hauler out there that does monthly billing. Mine's 3205 every month. Um, and so, anyway, I just want to make you aware of that. Uh, Mr. Dixon, guest counselor Dixon, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Hoy and Mr. Zink. Thank you for the information. It's really helpful. Uh, just one question on the 30% discount for moving to every other week service. Was consideration given to a 50% discount since there would be only 50% as many pickups at that location? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it, on the surface, it would seem that that would be natural, right? You're, you're coming by half as often to pick up the trash, and so why shouldn't the, the rate be, be half as much? Um, what's lost, I think, in, in that, that initial conversation of that question is um, we need to remember that there's more than more services provided, and you're paying for more service than just garbage pickup. You're also getting a weekly yard debris pickup, which includes so all yard yard waste, um, also kitchen scraps, so that mixed organics, um, also the commingled recycling. Um, uh, some people think that the haulers make a lot of money off of selling that recycling or, or selling the compost, which I can tell you they do not. Um, uh, another piece is the um, the red cart or the red bin for glass recycling and all that. So all of those are are pieces of the um, overall cost uh, service that's being provided. Um, so yes, they're coming by and picking up the the trash every other week or half as often, but the rest of the services remain intact. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. 
Councilor Barney. Oops, you're still on mute, Councilor. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. I had a couple of quick questions. I actually like this a la carte system. I've been sitting here kind of working through some figures and um, uh, it's good to see the 20 gallon every other week. I like that. Um, after looking at the fee schedule or the rate schedule, it looks like someone could take a 35 gallon that they have now and switch to a 20 gallon every other week and maybe add a re an additional recycle bin onto it for 580. I mean, I'm just looking at options here where folks could potentially increase what they're recycling and still re reduce their overall cost. And so is, is that actually something you could do with these new rates and the way this is laid out? Uh, yeah, I mean, there certainly are some options within there. Um, you know, we, we, there's the standard uh, menu, if you will, of the 20, 35, and 65 gallon cart. And now we've added the 20 gallon every other week. Uh, service as well, but there, you know, additional uh, recycling can be added, or uh, sometimes people will add um, a, additional yard debris. Certainly during the fall season, or maybe uh, times when there's they're doing a lot of extra yard work, and so there are uh, extra pieces that can be added to your service to to really meet your needs. No, I think that's a great idea, and I think just the education component of it. So. Folks know that these options are available because I look at what's being offered now and I'm going to be able to reduce my cost because I always fill up my recycle bin. I could really use another one, but I don't fill up my garden, you know, my regular 20 gallon, for example. And so this would really work for me and I just like the option. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I think that on-call service also, right, where you where you call when when your garbage can is full. I think that's a really a great option for some folks as well. I'm really glad to see that as an option, um, I, Mr. Zink. I was curious, what is driving the cost increase to the the mixed organics? Well, there's a couple of pieces there, um, but uh, the. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying not to get into the weeds um, on on the details of that. Oh, that was a good but, one. Weeds on the mixed organic. <laughs> I like that. But um, um it, we're we're full of puns around here with solid waste. Uh, so <clears throat> the some of you may be familiar with the MRF. It's the Marion Resource Recy uh, Resource Recovery Facility that's in Brooks, and that is owned and operated. Um, by uh, uh, the Haulers Association, which is so it's actually a very unique uh, uh, um, operation where you have actually eight haulers because there's, there's two additional haulers that operate outside of the city of Salem, but they have come together many years ago and they operate together and work well together, uh, including that uh, big national company that we were talking about earlier. So they're, they're part of that consortium, if you will. Um, recently, uh, they uh, th so that the MRF um, uh, underwent a uh, I was I'm going to call it a massive expansion where they uh, on on their uh, recovery side they've added a, a wonderful facility wonderful facility out there and I'd love for you guys to go out there and take a tour of it where they're able to uh, increase um, both the volume and the recovery uh, of material that's taken there so just as an example all the material that you take out to uh, uh, the transfer station, whether it be North Marion or Salem Kaiser transfer station, goes in that pit. That all gets put in giant boxes and it's taken to the MRF and is and is sorted. Um, and uh, any recoverable material is taken out of that, and then the the remainder of it then then is disposed of. So there's a lot of material that's recovered out of that. At that facility, um, the yard debris or mixed organics is also processed so it's it's taken there uh anything that's not supposed to be in it is taken out you'd be surprised what actually ends up in there um you know concrete chunks or engine blocks or bowling balls um all, all sorts of things so that's removed from that from that material shredded chopped up and then it's sent to um, the prc in corvallis for its its final processing there so that process 
um, there's a cost associated with uh, with the cost of processing the material there, and then the cost of of it, uh, its final disposal down in Corvallis with the PRC. At the time that the that new facility was being built, um, it was determined that there was a significant subsidy that was occurring on the uh, yard debris piece of that. Now, initially, in order to uh, get that that line of business, if you will, that that uh, operation um, back up to uh, uh, not losing money, you know, being being uh, uh, cost recovery for that service. Initially, there had been a plan to increase uh, that that um, disposal fee incrementally over time. Unfortunately, because of the extreme inflation that we've had recently, that plan had to be uh, um, escalated, had to had to uh, go through faster. Um, and so that's what we're experiencing here. Um, the equivalent, so if, if that facility did not exist um, and we were uh, sending it to uh, other um, other MRFs or other processing centers, we would be, uh, uh, the haulers, I should say, would be paying the, the rate that this is being increased to. So in that, that 80 to, to mid $80 per ton. So we've been getting a significant discount because of that subsidy. This is reversing that subsidy. And um, there's also the in impacts of uh, inflation in there. Did that answer your question? I think I got my answer out of there. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. You got into the weeds quite a bit, but I think I sort of threw it. I, so, I apologize for the weeds, and I can. I, if you want more later, we can go. We can dive deeper, but uh, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Zink. I just want to say I did not know that about the transfer station. I did not know that it was it was taken away and sorted. That makes me feel so much better about going there. So. Thank you for that. That's amazing. Um, and then another question that's always uh, I've pondered on is how do I buy the compost? Is it, it like what happens when it's processed and it becomes compost? Can folks buy it back? That is a great question that I don't have the answer to, but I have a feeling that someone at uh, Mid Valley Garbage might be able to answer that for us. Uh, this is Dan Strandy with Mid Valley Garbage. Um, yes, you can buy it back. And typically where you'll find it is at Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, when you, uh, if you were to buy a Scott's uh, bag, that's where the vast majority of the, uh, the high-end compost is sold to Scott's. They bag it and sell it locally. Some of it actually is shipped away, further away. Um, there is about another um, half of that compost that is spread into agricultural fields. But uh, there is a, approximately 50,000 tons that goes through the Scott's bag. So uh, wherever you can find a Scott's bag, you are actually buying your, your old uh, uh, yard scraps back. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councilor. That was a great question. Are there other questions? I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of give my speech that I give every time we deal with garbage rates, and that's that, you know, the city council doesn't control the tipping fees, we don't control where the garbage goes, and we don't control the fuel costs, and we don't control any of the costs that the, uh, really, that the haulers experience. The only thing we control are the rates, and uh, it's kind of frustrating because we don't have any control over any of the inputs, just the output, so to speak. And we're the ones that are on the receiving end of the public sentiment regarding the rates, uh, even though we have no control over any of the costs. So, but that's what we signed up for. And that's why we're here. We have to set the rates and we, it's important that our garbage haulers are able to stay in business and make a profit uh, of a reasonable amount. And just even though uh, it means that we're gonna get a lot of not so pleasant emails People are going to stop us in the grocery store and are going to talk to us about why we're, you know, question us about why we're raising their rates and that sort of thing. Um, it's an important thing that we do, and it's part of our duty. And as much as it's um, not pleasant, I think that this proposal, at least in my mind, um, gets us to where we've been trying to get to, gets us closer to where we've been trying to get to uh, for a while. So I appreciate that. Um, if there are no more questions, I just want to one quick one more quick check about questions before we close the public hearing. I don't see any more questions, so I will close the hearing.
And I will ask Councillor Stapleton if she has a motion. I do. Thank you so much. I move we adopt resolution number 2022-47, establishing solid waste management service rates effective January 1st, 2023, and rescinding resolution number 2021-49. Second. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Councillor Stapleton, you want to speak to your motion at all? Sure. Um, you know, I think I'm right with you on this, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, it is one of the duties that we have. Um, and, and having worked in the industry, of course, I, I uh, have had the privilege of getting to know them and, and the service behind the scenes. So um, I understand um, what's happening here and the costs that they're incurring. Um, I've also met with them and, and talked with folks um, within the industry, and so many of them are also very conscious and aware of the environmental crisis that we are all in. And I know that they're doing their best to further their impacts on the city within that realm and all of the ways that they can, they can aid in that. And I think that this is a small step in the right direction. I'm excited for us to to be kind of moving in that direction. And I know that over the years, this is only going to pick up steam and we're gonna become better and better at this. Um, I'm excited all the things that are on the on the horizon for us and our city. And I think this is a, a good place to start and continue. Uh, thank you, Councillor. And uh, I guess my only comments on this, the only thing I have left is that, Mr. Zink, I hope that we will continue to do whatever we can to encourage waste reduction, because I think that's where the real, um, the real work is that we can do is to uh, get people to stop uh, producing as much waste as they do and also to use our service. We have amazing services when it comes to waste, whether it's recycling and the mixed organics, but people need to use it properly. And that whatever the city can do to help encourage both of those things, I want to continue to do, especially uh, reducing waste by, by all of us. So um, anyway, I look forward to working with you more on that in the future. Is there any more discussion? Oh, Councilor Leon. Uh, thank you, Mayor uh, Pro Tem. Again, this is uh, Councilor Leon, Ward 4. Um, I'm having, I'm sort of on the fence at this moment, still in terms of where I'm going to vote on this. I have a, I still have a lot of concerns mm -hmm. in terms of um, equity and the fact that no outreach has been um, done before in a way that's been effective for members of our community to be aware of these kinds of programs that are available to help them, especially those who are experiencing significant financial hardship. Um, but at the same time, I understand that, you know, as you've mentioned um, several times repeatedly, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, in terms of what our role is, like we don't set, we don't do the other behind the scenes work in terms of, um, and it's, it's just frustrating to me to be able to now have to go back to uh, people, my residents, as well as you all, when you go back and talk to your residents in terms of, you know, why we're voting the way that we are going to vote on this particular matter. Thank you, Councillor. I completely understand. Any other comments? All right. If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. I have reservations, but I have to say no. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke absent. Councillor Varney? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Mayor Bennett, absent. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Zink. Appreciate it. That takes us to item five, special orders of business. So we are at 3.3 F, Councillor Phillips. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, oh. Councillor Nishioka has her hand up, raised. I think it has to do with our, our past vote. Oh, thank you. I lowered my head reading my document for a second. I didn't notice it. Thank you. Councillor Nishioka. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a motion um, regarding the um, policy. I'd like to move to ask the city staff to begin work on a policy for city council review that considers the following elements. Equitable service provision and rates climate action plan elements, Oregon Recycling Moder Modernization, Modernization Act, and review the service options of other cities and counties. Second. 
Councilor, would you like to speak to your motion? So I'm hoping that um, uh, Ryan uh, is able to review policies that can help improve reducing our solid waste and take a look at other counties and what they're doing, as have, was mentioned in some of the public hearing. So I'm hoping that other counselors would agree to this action. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, yeah, I am. I'm with you on this, uh, Councillor Nishioka. I think um, you know, in all of our conversations, even tonight, uh, Mr. Zink has heard us talking about that, and and I think he and other staff members have been able to come alongside us in emails and letting us know um, kind of their heart and their intent here. Um, to really take a, a strong look at this through the lens of equity, through the lens of our climate action plan, um, and look at the policy level um, on how we can we can service our residents better through this whole process. So I appreciate you bringing this forward. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, Pro Tem. A quick question just to clarify. So is this an addendum to the last motion we just passed or is this a brand new thing we're incorporating to uh, requesting to have done this is a standalone brand new motion in addition to the one the thing we just passed thank you you're welcome and councilor nishioka it would be helpful to me if you would restate your motion and i know i'm not sure that everybody had a chance to see it and I, I think it would just be helpful to hear it one more time <laughs> I move to ask the city staff to begin work on a policy for city council review that considers the following elements, equitable service provision and rates, climate action plan elements, Oregon's Recycling Modernization Act that Mr. Zink spoke of earlier, and reviews service options of other cities and counties. Thank you, Councillor. I think that was helpful to hear it a second time with a little bit of context. Councillor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and thank you, Councillor Nishioka, for the motion. Um, I do have a question. I think, broadly speaking, it's a it's a sounds like a good motion uh, that I would support. Um, I do recall that when I and a few other councillors toured um, one of the local recycling facilities, the name is escaping me. I had it ten seconds ago. Um, but uh, one of the things that they talked about is that, you know, some of this is, is beyond the control of the individual homeowner and that a lot of this is set by how much packaging is used uh, at the industry level. So I guess my question would be, does this motion start to look at that with that? Um, with the, I, I'm less familiar uh, with the act, the modernization act that's been mentioned, but my hope is that, you know, will we be then kind of joining that effort to encourage um, you know, a reduction in packaging and things done so that we as consumers and homeowners uh, that are, you know, uh, getting this service of, of garbage um, have less pa uh, packaging and, and things to dispose of. Thank you, Councillor. And I think before we go to an answer from staff on that, I, I noticed that our Deputy City Attorney has popped onto the screen, which usually is a good indication that he might have something to say. So I want to give him <laughs> the opportunity just in case, in case we're going a little too far afield, Mr. Capani. Uh, well, I didn't mean to interrupt uh, the conversation that was going on uh, about the motion. Uh, I wanted to sort of uh, loop in at the end and make sure, check in with uh, Mr. Zink to make sure he understood uh, what he was being asked to do. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Capani. I know that Mr. Zink did have an opportunity to see the motion ahead of time, and I believe I saw some uh, an email from him that uh, indicated his support and uh, understanding. So, yeah, we're good. And I think back, um, uh, Councillor um, Phillips, I think that Mr. Zink would be better to answer. He already spoke about the uh, Modernization Act, and so I think that he can explain that, but it is about getting um, people that use the packaging to find ways to improve the recyclability of that. So I'll let him answer. Uh, thank you, Councillor. So it, yes, um, uh, staff is, is fully in support of this motion. Um, and thank you for uh, allowing us to help draft, draft it earlier. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I think it was related to uh, looking at, you know, if we were to add a 35 gallon every other week service. 
our current uh, city code and kind of the, the current um, uh, sidebars, if you will, for this this rate review process um, are just that. There are some there are current uh, sidebars that that um, keep us from going too far out and keep uh, keep the existing uh, process in balance. Um, what I'm finding more and more is that uh, what we're the options that we're being asked to look at um, are outside of those sidebars. So this gives staff the opportunity to, um, you know, get a uh, get further direction from council, exploring uh, other options um, that can maybe move or expand those sidebars for how we we look and, and really help us rethink um, uh, how we provide uh, solid waste service and the rates associated with those services um, here in Salem. So this is an opportunity to kind of uh, kickstart that process getting council support um, to start that process of, of putting together a policy that incorporates these different elements that are that are upon us. Thank you, Mr. Zink. And I hope that answered your question, Councilor Phillips. <clears throat> and I just wanted to thank staff for this because I think that this is the work that we've been trying to get to for a few years now. And I think this motion is going to get us there uh, a lot further down the road uh, towards uh, the place we really want to get to. So thank you for that. Councilor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor Pro Temp Hoy. And uh, Linda, I have a quick question. Um, when, when you, when you, with regards to the definition of equity or what's included in that, and uh, Mr. Zink, will you also take into account multi-generational households? You know, because I know, you know, the last time we talked about this, you know, they didn't want to, we didn't want to have as a council, a larger unit, right? But you have a lot of families, that, especially the immigrant families, you know, they come from a culture that it's okay to not, to live past 18, you know, in your own home. And, and being in real estate for 25 years, I always get these side comments of like, well, that house has too many cars. It's, they have too many cars. Why are they parking like that? Well, they don't understand it's a, it's a result. It's a, it's a um, survival. It's survival. It's uh, being able to handle poverty, you know. And so, does when we're talking about equity, I just want to make sure that these families aren't left behind because those families are actually doing what we want. We want more people in a similar in a smaller footprint. You know, we want them to be sharing resources. And in this case, I just don't want them to to be punished for doing the right thing. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Gonzalez. I'm not sure. I think equity includes all kinds of factors. And again, this would be direction led by city staff. Um, and I think making that clear to Mr. Zink, I think that would probably be included. And in I will again let Mr. Zink have the floor. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Zink? Uh I, I really appreciate your your uh, comments, Councilor Gonzalez. Um, I know that was, uh, I remember your comments from uh, this time last year, I guess it was last December when we were considering the 95 gallon service. And as we have looked at um, other communities, we're finding that most other communities, many of those that have the, the multiple options at the other, other every other week do also include a 95 gallon service. Um, and sometimes it's a 95 gallon every other week as well. So there's, um, I think that would certainly be um, something that would be included uh, as we're looking at that research and, you know, seeing what options um, are really uh, need to be included in our, in our uh, menu, if you will. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zink. Are there any other comments or questions on this one? All right, if the reporter will please call the roll. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leon. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke absent. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Mayor Bennett absent. Motion passes. Congratulations, Councilor Nishioka. Most councilors uh, go a few meetings before they make the first motion and get it passed. So good job, right out of the chute. And now we'll go back to item 3.3F, Aaron Councilor Phillips. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I move staff recommendation that council shall reallocate uh, $750,000 previously earmarked for the Front Street Safe Park site uh, 
to a Turner Road Southeast micro shelter village. I'll second. Second. Uh, yeah. Seconded by Councilor Stapleton. All right, uh, discussion. I mean, just briefly, um, uh, I, I, I pulled this, you know, more uh, for highlighting it and to give an opportunity for, for everybody here who has any questions. Um, you know, it's my understanding that, uh, you know, my motion to do the, the safe parking um, on Front Street is really just no longer feasible and not ideal to move forward for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, fortunately, we have another option um, that moves us to sheltering and providing more, you know, immediate or close to immediate, you know, services in the near future. Um, and I, I have certainly gone to the neighborhood association meetings at SEMCA. It seems like they're, they've been in support of a move in this direction. So uh, I'm for one, you know, in support of this. I think I understand uh, what staff did here and, and yeah. Uh, that's why I pulled it. I think it's good that we're still, I would prefer that we could do both. Um, but since we can't seem to do front street, I'm, I'm glad that this is, this is happening in its place. Thank you, counselor. And I see Ms. Bennett has joined us. I think that means she might have something to say to give us a little bit more background on uh, how we got here. I am just happy to take your questions if you like. Councillor Phillips is correct. This is the third of the three locations that council approved back in the winter when you when you asked for additional locations to be potentially used to help shelter people experiencing homelessness. And this is the third of those now. We expect um, Center Street to be activated next month. Front Street has proven cost ineffective. And so that would bring to Turner Road and that would actualize the three locations that council approved in the winter. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. I think the other thing that we just need to acknowledge out loud is that this, with the, the, the changes committed to by Mr. Vincent, this really sort of helps us uh, close the loop on the work we've been promising the folks, the residents of Paradise Island and to Mr. Poole. And I'm really happy to see us doing that tonight. Um, assuming that this passes. I think that that's really a, an important thing to start to bring more peace of mind and community back to that area. So I'm really glad that we're able to do that. Are there other questions or comments? Councilor Phillips. I just thought of one I hadn't thought of till just now. Um, I don't know if DJ is still here um, and, and perhaps Gretchen can answer it as well, but you know, yes. what what would be our, our timeline if we approve this? You know, when are we looking at you know seeing actual you know in the real world services and sheltering? Great question. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. Can you address that? Yeah. So the good news is we have a year's head start on working on the site plan. So you know we'll start making calls tomorrow on lining out the work, and then we've had a few months head a month's head start on hiring the youth support staff. And so many of those folks are in place. And so it is our hope. The, the best chance is opening in December with the work that needs to be done on the ground and ordering um, the shelters and having them built. And so hopefully we'd be celebrating a December opening. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. And just for the public's knowledge, those who are watching, those, those shelters are going to be built right here in West Salem. So uh, it's pretty exciting. Local company, local labor, local business. So that's that's great. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to say that how happy I am to kind of see a, a, a good ending here. You know, I feel like over the past two years um, that I've been on council, you know, it's been one of those really struggling um hard situations that we um, as counselors are faced with, the folks who are struggling at Paradise Island and, and the park um, and not being able to use it and just so many really hard situations happening. So I'm excited to see this next step and to, to know that there's so much support for it as well. It just um, it makes my heart happy. So thank you so much for that. I have a question for staff. Um, with Front Street not working um, out the way that we had hoped, are we now engaged in kind of opening up to look for another third site? 
Well, thank you. That's a great question. I know one way we're actively looking is within the safe park program that exists right now. I know there's been an active call for additional property owners, faith based organizations who might want to participate in that current model. Um, I know the state of Oregon is examining properties that they own as a result of Mayor Pro Tem State Representative Hoy's bill through the Oregon legislative process. And we're looking forward to seeing if any of the properties there are viable. Um, there's also that question of, should you have additional dollars available? How would you want to allocate that? You know, you have a series of priorities that you've laid out and invested in in the past couple of years and questions of sustainability could emerge for you as well, as well as seeing what other organizations are currently able to bring to the table in terms of expanding shelter resources. So several variables there. Thank you so much. Yeah, I am very thankful for state representative counselor, Mayor Pro Tem's work that he's done at the Senate or at the House there. I really appreciate it, Chris. Thank you, Counselor. Are there any more questions or comments? All right. Will the reporter please call the roll? Counselor Leung. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke absent. Councilor Barney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Nishioka. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Mayor Bennett absent. Motion passes. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding the one information report we have tonight? I'm not sure if I've ever seen just one. That's a, that's a new thing. Are there questions or comments on that one? All right, we will move on to first readings. Councillor Stapleton, do you have a motion? Did I didn't know if you wanted me to do it or Councillor Phillips. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Prepared. Yeah, it's, I could do it if you want me to. I am so sorry, Councillor Phillips. Thank you. Uh, I move staff recommendation to advance ordinance bill number 16-22, which vacates the three easements adjacent to Reed Road Southeast at its intersections with Strong Road Southeast and Lindbergh Road Southeast to a second reading for enactment. Second. Any discussion? Briefly, uh, this is really good. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, the, 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 Final improvements to the, the north three quarters of, of Reed Road. This has a, been a big thing for the community. So I'm really thrilled. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion? Will the reporter please call the roll? And actually, I, I need to call the first uh, first reading. So That's what I was thinking. And then I'll just follow that up with the roll call. Ordinance Bill number 1622, an ordinance vacating two public utility easements and one sidewalk easement adjacent to Reed Road Southeast at its intersections with Strong Road Southeast and Lindbergh Road Southeast. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke absent. Councilor Varney? Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Nishioka? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councilor Leung? Aye. Mayor Bennett absent. Thank you. Motion passes. And we'll go on to second reading. Ordinance Bill number 1522, an ordinance declaring certain territory located at 3518 to 3598 Cherry Glen Place Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Marion County Fire District number one, East Salem Sewer and Drainage District. Mayor Pro Tem Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke absent. Councilor Rennie. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Bennett absent. Ordinance passes. Thank you. Now we do have two folks signed up under item eight. So I will call up Phil Carver. You have three minutes. Remind us of your ward or your address. And please stop at the end of three minutes. 
Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Hoy, and uh, council members and staff. Um, we have been asked to um, write a voters pamphlet in favor of the bond measure, and the last work group had a discussion of the fire equipment. And we have a long-standing, detailed um, com written comments on this, which I've resubmitted, that we are very concerned about the use of the fire equipment to respond to medical emergencies. The fire department does not have appropriate vehicles, and so these giant fire trucks with their diesel emissions are roaming around for health emergencies um, when it's totally inappropriate. And most other cities use smaller vehicles, and we recommend small electric vehicles or electric motorcycles. Um, and in fact, if there was an emergency in a park, like the um, Minto Brown Park, you couldn't get a fire truck in there. You couldn't get an ambulance. You'd have to get some kind of, I don't know how you'd get down there with a, but a motorcycle would certainly be able to get down into the park where there's the bicycle path, the bicycle and walking paths. Um, and so um, this gives us pause. Um, you, you haven't, nothing, nothing in the workshop explain why the fire department is not considering purchasing um, and using appropriate vehicles to respond to health emergencies. Less than 5% of fire equipment is used to fight fires. And a, ba a big, big fraction of the responses are to health emergencies. And what you have is $26 million being spent to replace equipment that was worn out prematurely because it was overused for health emergencies. And so I'd ask at least that there be a public discussion at some point about why the bond issue is replacing equipment that will be worn out prematurely if, it's re if, it the, if the continued use of this equipment is for health emergencies. Um, and so this is a serious issue and we haven't heard any response or discussion um, from the fire chief or anybody else about why fire equipment, and this is not just 350 Salem's concern, by the way, I'm sorry, it's Phil Carver. Um, I live at 1007 Newport Road, Southeast, 97306. And I'm representing 350 Salem in these comments. Um, and this is not just a concern of 350 Salem. I've heard discussions with several other people about why do these fire trucks show up at emergencies? And sometimes they have to park in the middle of the street, like on, on sunny, sunny side, they were blocking the street because they couldn't get down a driveway to deal with a health emergency on Sunnyside Road. Um, and so I, I'd just like to hear a discussion at some point of why the bond issue is gonna replace fire equipment that was worn out prematurely because it was dispatched to health emergencies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carver. And now we have Danae Bedlock. Danae, are you here? I see her on the participant list, but so far I don't see her. Danae Medlock, are you here? Okay, I guess not. So I'm here. Uh, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Sorry about that, Chris. I had a weird technical issue. Okay. Um, can um, you share Ms. this Medlock, screen with me? Can you go ahead and state your name and either your award or your address for the record, please? Sure. Um, my name is Danae Medlock, and I am part of Ward 4. Go ahead. And um, can I share my screen? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to find... Here we go. Share screen. There. Okay, coming up. Thank you for your patience. And I look forward to the timer too. It's very good. Okay. Share. Can you guys see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So um, I'm going to start with my presentation is about easing the transition to retirement by preparing to the next stage of life and how I think we can do that. So as many retirees discover, leaving one life to begin another is difficult. And the truth is, even though most professionals look forward to retirement, the loss of a job can be unexpectedly traumatic. 
jobs provide mental health benefits that include feelings of con contribution and being appreciated, the satisfaction of solving problems and learning new things, relationships with fellow workers, and daily routines eliminating mental decisions about what to do next. In many cases, the transition period towards retirement is loaded with uncertainty among the population, with retirees being more susceptible to developing mental health problems. I propose a pilot program for the city that focuses on retirement prep for city employees and, and as well as state employees. I feel Salem is well positioned to lead as an example for other cities. We already have many organizations in Salem who could bring this all together. Um, we already have through, I know, Center 50 Plus and Salem Health um, classes on preventative health. Um, I know for volunteering, the city has a great website that has all those things together. I know that all of these things, you could search around the web and find them, but it would be really nice to have this as an option for people before they retire. There are interesting things that many people don't think about until they've actually retired. I heard from a senior citizen today that they were shocked to find out that they could not apply for social security until after they retired. And so there was a gap period where they didn't have any income. And if you don't plan for that, I mean, that's something that is a real problem. So I know for me, it's really important to know that- Thank you, Ms. Medlock. I'm sorry, but your oh. time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Could you do the stop share, please? Yeah. Right thank, now. thank you. Stop there. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, we don't have anybody else signed up. And so I'm sorry, uh, Councillor uh, Barney. Yes. What? Oh, thank you. I wanted to just quickly touch on what um, Mr. Carver was talking about with the response vehicles. I've heard yes. a lot of questions from folks, and I don't know how to proceed, but I feel we do need some sort of a discussion somehow um, just to kind of look at other options and possibilities, and I just didn't know how to go about that. Okay. So I think our, I know that the chief is not with us this evening, but I know our interim city manager is here. Do you have any uh, uh, suggestions or comments on that, Ms. Rutherford? Well, I think that we have a couple of different options. One is um, as we move towards our November policy agenda meeting, it's an item that we could bring a staff report back for discussion at that time. Um, that meeting is not until after the bond vote, however. So another option would be that in September, we could have the chief come back with a staff report um, that looks at current practices, what's occurring in other communities um, and why they operate as they do and what a transition would involve. I think that would be a great idea, Ms. Rutherford. I know this is not the first time we've had this conversation in my five years on the council. We've had it at least two times uh, before this. Um, and I've um, so these are questions I've had in the past as well, and I think that it would be helpful, especially for our newer counselors to hear um, hear from the chief. Also, you know, things change, and so maybe there's some some new updates that the chief would like to give us. So I think it would be a great thing to do in September. Uh, Councillor Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Hoy. Um, and I guess my, my question would be, and I, maybe this is out of order because Phil's gone off, but um, if Mr. Carver could answer, uh, you know, the deadline to get a, a voter's pamphlet statement, which I think is what originally generated, you know, his request was to, you know, support for the voter's pamphlet. Is there a time frame where we could, you know, or staff could work with um, him or his, his group to satisfy their questions in that time frame, I mean, it's coming up next week, so I, I'm not sure if the answer is yes. Um, you know, I've I've certainly heard his question before. Um, I've talked to staff in the past about this. Uh, my day job is that I'm an emergency room doctor. Um, 
I mean, I think that there is potentially some some wiggle room. You know, uh, now I'm in comments more than questions, but I think there may be some wiggle room to move in that direction a bit. But you know, good high quality CPR saves lives, and it's it's exhausting. And my understanding is that sometimes the fire apparatus are, are who can get there the fastest. Um, and, uh, you know, time, you know, the faster you get there can make a big difference and save lives. So, um, I, I don't know if I agree with, uh, Mr. Carver's, you know, all of the statements, I certainly don't agree with them hundred percent. I'm in favor of the bond. Um, I support it emphatically. I think that the, the fire apparatus, um, are probably at an expected point based, not just on miles traveled, but time to be replaced as well. That's my understanding. So, um, you know, I would, I would certainly like to keep working with his group to try and get everybody on board. We're going to need, you know, to get to 50% plus one vote for passage, but I'm, I'm very enthusiastic on this. And my, my goal would just be, is there a way to resolve his concerns within the next week? Well, thank Hi. you, Councillor. I don't want to put staff in an unfortunate and, and difficult position to ask them to deal with something that might have to do with the voters pamphlet, because that's really not appropriate for staff mm -hmm. that's really something for elected officials to deal with and not for staff we can't ask them i think to work on since mr carver mentioned the voters pamphlet um i don't think it's appropriate to ask them to be involved in that conversation that's something that elected officials would have to take on we could certainly ask our staff to come back and just give us more information later at a on this topic but i don't think asking them to resolve something in the next week uh, would be appropriate so uh, but i i appreciate your intent and it's something that probably as electeds we would have to take up and not burden our staff with that thank you for that point you bet you bet is there anything else? All right, thank you everybody, we are adjourned. Thank you everybody. For more videos and for more information, go to capitalcommunitymedia.org and follow us on social media.